This is Paul Ekberg from the Division of Infectious Diseases at Stanford University. In this part two video, we will discuss three antibacterial classes of protein synthesis inhibitors, the macrolides, the lincosamides, and the oxazolidinones. The other protein synthesis inhibitors are discussed in part one of this video. Learning objectives include list the common clinical uses of the macrolides, Compare the spectrum of activity and clinical uses of the lincosamides versus the oxazolidinones. Describe the limitations of clindamycin and linazolid use, for example, adverse effects or resistance. Explain the MLSB resistance mechanism. And name the protein synthesis inhibitors that have activity against methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus. As discussed in part one, this overview will focus on the protein synthesis inhibitors, which is a diverse group of antibiotics, including a number of different antibiotic classes. Here in part two, we will focus on the commonly used protein synthesis inhibitors that target the 50S ribosomal subunit, highlighted here in yellow. Specifically, we will cover the macrolides, represented by azithromycin, the lincosamides, represented by clindamycin, and the oxazolidinones, represented here by linazolid. This slide was introduced in the part one video, and I show it again here to remind you that the macrolides, lincosamides, and oxazolidinones block protein synthesis at the 50S ribosomal subunit, shown here in the yellow box. Note that the other antibiotic, called chloramphenicol, is listed in the yellow box as well. However, this older protein synthesis inhibitor is rarely used in clinical practice today and won't be covered in the video. Let's start with the macrolides. This class of antibiotics is important given the wide range of infections for which they are used, in part due to their broad spectrum of activity. Representative examples are seen in the blue box where erythromycin, the oldest member, is listed first. Over recent years, erythromycin has largely been replaced by the newer macrolides, clarithromycin and azithromycin, which have enhanced activity against some common respiratory pathogens are better tolerated, including less gastrointestinal adverse events, and are more easily administered once or twice daily, as opposed to erythromycin. The macrolides have similar broad spectrum of activity as the tetracyclines, which you learned about in part one. However, there are some differences, such as the macrolides activities against Bordetella pertussis, Bartonella species, and non-tubercular mycobacterial species. Regarding clinical uses, the macrolides are usually administered for upper or lower respiratory tract infections, such as community-acquired pneumonia, diphtheria, and pertussis. However, the incidence of macrolide-resistant streptococcus pneumoniae has increased dramatically over recent years, limiting this class's use as monotherapy in pneumonia, for which streptococcus pneumoniae is the most common cause. With regard to adverse effects, gastrointestinal effects as with most antibiotics, are the primary adverse effects for the macrolides, especially erythromycin. This is one of the primary reasons why clarithromycin and azithromycin have largely replaced this older macrolide in clinical practice. Erythromycin is also more commonly associated with other adverse effects, such as hepatotoxicity and cholestatic jaundice, and a unique syndrome called prolonged QT syndrome. This prolongation of the QT interval, which is the interval between the Q wave and the T wave on the electrocardiogram, is uncommon but very important, as this can predispose a patient to arrhythmias, including a life-threatening arrhythmia called torsade de pointe, as seen in this figure. Lincosamides are represented by a single member, clindamycin. With regard to bacterial infections, Clindamycin use is limited to gram-positive pathogen infections, especially infections involving methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, or MRSA, and anaerobic infections reflective of its spectrum of activity that you can see in the first bullet. In addition, clindamycin may be used in combinations to treat opportunistic infections in AIDS, such as pneumocystis pneumonia and toxoplasmosis, which are interestingly fungal and parasitic infections respectively. Some drawbacks to using this drug include gastrointestinal intolerability, including a metallic taste, and the more serious adverse effect of Clostridium difficile associated disease. Similar to the aminoglycosides discussed in part one, the oxazolidinones are narrow spectrum agents 
However, in contrast to the immunoglycosides, the oxazolidinones are active against gram-positive pathogens rather than gram-negatives. Its spectrum of activity includes very potent activity versus MRSA. And for this reason, this class of antibiotics is primarily reserved for treating infections caused by MRSA. Examples include skin and soft tissue infections, nosocomial pneumonia, such as hospital-acquired pneumonia, and ventilator-associated pneumonia. Recall that all protein synthesis inhibitors are bacteriostatic rather than bactericidal. Therefore, these agents are not used for severe gram-positive infections that require bactericidal agents, such as bloodstream infections or infections that might affect immunocompromised patients. Similar to nearly all antibiotic classes, the main adverse events associated with the oxazolidinones are gastrointestinal in nature. You can see here nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea might be experienced with this drug. Central nervous system effects, such as dizziness and headache, are not uncommon. However, the oxazolidinones are associated with a number of rare and potentially serious adverse events that the clinician must keep in mind. One such event is the serotonin syndrome, depicted here in the picture. This is related to the fact that linazolid is a monoamine oxidase inhibitor, or MAO inhibitor. And as a side note, linazolid was originally developed as a potential antidepressant. MAO inhibitors lead to an increase in serotonin neurotransmission. The clinical features of this are related to autonomic instability, such as high blood pressure or hypertension, sweating or diaphoresis, agitation, and muscle clonus, to name a few. And these can progress to coma and even death if left untreated. This syndrome may be invoked by the concomitant use of selected serotonin reuptake inhibitors, a class of antidepressants, and linazolid. Linazolid's MAO inhibition might also lead to severe hypertension if administered with other serotonergic or adrenergic medications, or if given with high tyramine foods, such as aged or fermented cheeses, processed meats or beverages, such as beer, as tyramine is a catecholamine-releasing agent. Finally, the oxazolidinones might lead to hypoglycemia or low blood sugars, or rarely peripheral and optic neuropathy. This slide was introduced in the part one video, but is shown again here to point out that a unique resistance mechanism used by bacteria to resist the activity of the macrolides and lincosamides is called MLSB resistance, which I list here as a type of ribosomal protection. Note that I don't discuss streptogramin B at all in this video, as this antibiotic is not used currently in routine clinical practice. This is detailed on the next slide. MLSB resistance first emerged in the 1950s in gram-positive pathogens and is now the most common resistance mechanism against these three types of antibiotics, the macrolides, lincosamides, and streptogramin B. This type of resistance results from methylation of the 50S ribosomal subunit, specifically its 23S rRNA component, at the target binding site of these antibiotics, preventing their binding and activity. The methylase enzymes that methylate the binding site are encoded by ERM genes, over 40 of which have been described to date. This gene can be induced or constitutively expressed by bacteria. Unfortunately, this type of resistance has led to major treatment limitations. For example, macrolides were once reliable treatment options for pneumonia caused by Streptococcus pneumoniae, the most common cause of community-acquired pneumonia. However, now nearly 40 to 50 percent of pneumococci in the U.S. are currently macrolide resistant, limiting the use of macrolides in this very common and important infection.